Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The basis for our meditation is our gospel lesson taken from Luke chapter 10. May the words from my mouth and the meditation from our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Billy Bob, Bubba's son, last week he was in preschool. This week he's in his second year of college. You can do that when you have imaginary friends, by the way. Anyway, he decided he wanted to move out of the dorm and into an apartment. Bubba and Bubbette weren't quite so sure, but they talked about it and said, well, he's got to learn to fend for himself eventually, and this is a good step. So they helped him move, set him up, went home, waited a week or two, and then they had a call. They asked how it was going. Billy Bob said, that's ah, going mostly good. Bubba said, that's great. He said, how are you getting along with your neighbors? He said, well, I'm doing okay with most of them. Bubba says, most of them? Something going on? He said, well, the guy who lives above me, at 5 o'clock in the morning, he likes to stomp on his floor, which is my ceiling. <laughs> And Bubba said, that's not so good. Have you chatted with him? And Billy Bob says, no, I haven't. It's really not that big a deal because most of the time, I'm up practicing my trumpet anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that story illustrates why Jesus told the parable that we usually call the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan is told to a lawyer, translate that Bible scholar, not lawyer in the sense of how we think of lawyers, but a Bible scholar, someone who studied God's law. A lawyer is kind of clueless about how this whole thing of salvation really works. So Jesus tells a parable we call the Good Samaritan. He comes to Jesus, and did you notice? He didn't come to Jesus to learn anything. He came to test or challenge Jesus. He came to show off his Bible knowledge. I guess he didn't really understand the purpose of the Bible. He thought maybe it was to learn a bunch of facts, memorize a bunch of verses, so I can show off my knowledge, maybe in Bible class, maybe out in the community, maybe when I play Trivial Pursuit. What he didn't grasp is that the Bible is written that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ and by believing have life in his name. The Bible scholar didn't understand that salvation is not by works. He did not understand that we are justified by grace through faith. God looks at us just as if we've never sinned because of his grace, his undeserved love for us. But the Bible scholar wanted to justify himself. If you were at the adult new member class a few weeks ago, you'll understand when I say he believed in the religion of do. You've got to do something in order for God to give you his favor. In order for God to like you. In order for God to let you into heaven, you've got to do something. The religion of do is a false religion. We believe in the religion of done. 
Jesus has done everything necessary for our salvation. When he went to the cross to pay for our sins and said, it is finished, it was done. We believe in the religion of done. The religion of do always has this nagging question. Have I done enough? And the honest answer is no. The false answer is yeah, look at me. I'm really something. And wish everybody was like me. So the religion of do leads to despair or it leads to false and phony pride. We believe in the religion of done. But here's the problem. Sometimes, like that Bible scholar, we flirt with the religion of do. We wonder if we've done enough. And we often do this by what I call the comparison game. Anytime we start comparing ourselves to other folk, there's a good chance we're flirting with the religion of do. You post your Facebook pictures from vacation. You get 57 likes. You feel pretty good about that. Until your friend, you notice, posted his or her pictures, and they get 127 likes. And all of a sudden, we feel like not <coughs> enough. Have you ever heard of a young lady named Asina O'Neill? I came across her story in a book called Seculosity. Crazy title, but a very good book. She was an Australian model. She spent three years building her following on various social platforms. And she did this mostly by po posting pictures of herself. And after a while, she had over one half million followers. That meant money. That meant sponsorships and people following her. And they thought she was all of that and a bag of chips. <laughs> but Asina <coughs> confessed that she felt lonely lost and miserable and one day she posted a picture and she talked honestly about her feelings this is what she wrote I posted this picture of myself please like this photo I put on makeup I curled my hair I put on a tight dress and big uncomfortable jewelry. I took over 50 shots until I got one that I thought you would like. Then I edited this photo for ages on several apps just so I could feel some social approval from you. And then in all caps, which if you're familiar with Computer language, all caps, is shouting. In all caps, she wrote, there is nothing real about this picture. Now, if Asina were the only one playing the comparison game, I'd be wasting your time. But the truth is, we all do it, don't we? Why? Is that pastor's, that pastor's church growing faster than my church? Why did he get a promotion when I thought 
I deserved it. How come he gets to start and I'm sitting on the bench and I'm a better player than he is? How come his kid gets all A's? Just once. I'd like to see a bumper sticker that says, my kid is an average student at such and such a school. <laughs> The Bible scholar was playing a game. He wanted to be enough by his own deeds. He was trying to justify himself. And because Jesus loved this man, and because he loves you and he knows we all have that problem of flirting with the religion of do, he told a parable. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning designed to make one ponder, puzzle, think, and then by the power of the Holy Spirit to make a decision for Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to modernize the parable as I think Jesus might have told it if he were talking to people in 2022. A Lutheran is in a bad part of town. He's held up. He's beaten. He's robbed. He's left on the street half dead. A pastor is driving by. He sees him. And he says, well, I'll pray for him. But he keeps going. Not because he isn't concerned but because he's more concerned about himself than he is that guy in the street. An elder, or a Sunday school teacher, or a good Christian, whatever that is, sees him. And he drives by because, well, too bad. I mean, I feel bad, but this is a bad part of town, and something might happen to me. An illegal immigrant, a Muslim, who's here because he's part of the Taliban and seeing what he can see, sees the half-dead Lutheran on the street. And he knows it's a bad part of town, but Jesus says he has compassion. He picks up the Lutheran, puts him in his minivan, and drives him to the hospital. He spends the night in the emergency room with him. And in the morning, he leaves a deposit of $5,000 to cover the costs. And he says, if that's not enough, here's my number, call me and I'll take care of the rest. And you say, come on. That's kind of over the top, isn't it, Pastor? That's crazy. That could never happen. <clears throat> After Jesus tells his parable, he asks, who is my neighbor? And the Bible scholar, who wanted to justify himself, said, the one who showed mercy to his neighbor. I looked at that a lot this last week. And I wondered how he said it. I don't know. Did he say it grudgingly? Or did he say it joyfully because he was pondering, puzzling, and thinking and the Holy Spirit was working through the Word and leading him to the truth that could set him free. Did he come to realize that trying to justify oneself is like trying to nail jello to the wall? <coughs> it's a black hole that leads to sadness, loneliness, anger, 
false pride and the nagging question, have I done enough? Enter the real good Samaritan. Not me, not you, but of course, Jesus. Jesus. To make an eternal difference in our lives and in our lives in the here and now, Jesus rescues us from that black hole called the religion of do. And he does this with an over-the-top, no way anybody would ever do such of a thing. The sinless one comes to a sin-filled planet. And he takes my sin, and that's a huge amount. He takes your sin. He takes the sin of the entire world. The sinless one does this. The one who actually could earn salvation. That one takes our sin and makes it his. And he carries it to a cross. And he washes it all away with holy, precious blood. You see, he cared more about what was going to happen to you then he cared about what was going to happen to him. So he faced that cross. He didn't deny us, but he took up his cross and went to that cross for you and me. And brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm here today to tell you that that indeed is enough. When he said it is finished, it was done. All sin for all time was paid for. And to prove it, he rose victorious. So, the good news. God looks at you just as if you've never sinned. Enough. God's crazy in love with you. Whether you got 20,000 likes, or you got two likes and it was your mom and your dad. Doesn't matter. God loves you. You belong to Him. Doesn't care if you put on makeup today or not. Doesn't care if you're an honor student or just barely getting by. Doesn't care if you're a star athlete or sitting on the bench. God loves you. And if He had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. <laughs> That's how much he loves you. Now, what do we do with all that? And I'm not going to read the or look at the ending I had written because a new one hit me on the way here. So we'll see how this goes. It struck me that the way Jesus described the parable was that the good Samaritan had compassion on the man. That's a powerful word. It's a lot stronger than pity. In my mind's eye, when someone has compassion, it leads to an action. As most of you know, I used to be a fifth grade teacher. And any fifth graders out there, you can thank the Lord I no longer do that. <laughs> But I had, I had one kid in my class one year. His name was Little John. And he was about this tall. I think he'd been in fifth grade more than once. Anyway, he got in a lot of trouble. Got in trouble with me once in a while, too. When you heard about him in the teacher's lounge, most teachers weren't too crazy about him. But I really liked Little John. And I'll tell you why. I had another kid in the class. Her name was Tamara. She was about this big, little piece of a thing, and she had cerebral palsy. And she could walk, but she walked with a funny gait. And you know how kids can be. Some of them chose to make fun of her. Most of them had pity and just stayed out of her way. But when somebody made fun of her, Little John had compassion. And he made it known pretty quickly, if you mess with Tamara, 
you mess with me. And he didn't care if Mr. Faith was there and was going to take care of him after he took care of this kid. He had compassion on Tamara and he cared and it led to an action. Jesus said, the fields are ripe unto harvest. Oh, we all care, but do we have compassion? Do we take those feelings and turn them into actions? To build relationships, to invite somebody over for coffee, to give a kind word to a clerk, and to let them know that they are loved. And as they get to know they are loved, perhaps we get a chance to tell them that they are indeed enough. That Jesus has done everything necessary. And he looks at them as if they've never sinned. And their picture, too, is on his refrigerator. And when they hear that, you might just see his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in the true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. As a result of what we have heard, what is God asking us to believe or do in the coming week, especially for the good of others?